This is the Andres Segovia Show. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for joining the Andres Segovia Show. Uh, by all means, please let my audience know who you are and what do you do. All right. Uh, I'm David Cordero. I'm the executive director of the Apartment Association of Orange County. Um, our association has uh, been serving rental housing providers and industry suppliers for 60 years uh, here in Orange County and also in parts of Riverside County. Uh, we're a great resource for uh, housing providers who are looking for education, uh, business referrals, uh, business development opportunities, and uh, educational and uh, legislative support services. Uh, we represent um, our members in the cities where they own and operate rental property, uh, as well as providing representation with uh, state legislation up in Sacramento. And through our affiliation with the National Apartment Association, uh, we also help to engage and provide uh, the Orange and Riverside County perspective on uh, federal housing issues uh, through NAA and um, you know, make sure that uh, you know all of our lawmakers from the local level up to uh, up to the national level uh, understand uh, the issues that are important to us and the issues that are of concern and how we as an industry can uh, go about uh, providing solutions that uh, hopefully will bridge the gap between uh, the rental community as well as those who own and operate the rental units themselves. Amen. What you thanks. Yeah, uh, my name is Chip Allsweet, and I am the Vice President of External Affairs here at the Apartment Association of Orange County. Uh, my background comes from working with communities all over the country and trying to advocate for themselves with their local government, their state government, their federal government, and making sure that the community is well aware of what their issues are and how those issues impact uh, the individuals throughout the community. Because what we've found throughout all of our efforts working in property rights and real estate and these kinds of issues is the number one core driver of any economic engine in a community is real estate. Mm. You don't have commercial without real estate. You don't have residential without real estate. You don't have retail without real estate. And that means making sure that there is affordable, reliable, and safe housing for people on all economic levels. And we aim to ensure that that is possible. And we do that here at the Apartment Association. Uh, with our members and with uh, investors and people out there that are looking to make sure Orange County, Riverside County, and uh, all the communities in Southern California are able to sustain that economic engine that makes each community great. Uh, love the mission. And that's uh, what um, more apartment associations, if they don't put down the mission statement, that should be their mission statement. Because uh, uh, honestly, property owners are not really aware of apartment associations uh, being out there. Uh, uh, I think the rise in tenant activism and tenant activist groups um, are way more outspoken. And property owners sometimes feel like they have to fend for themselves, not realizing the associations like yours do exist. I mean, you mentioned, David, you said about 60 years now. That's correct. Yeah. And I never heard of the AAOC um, up until about a couple of months ago when I received a mailer and it wasn't from you guys. It came from the California Apartments Association and um, that sent a letter on behalf of their, uh, the, the new organization specifically um, trying to address what's, uh, what was transpiring in Santa Ana uh, for why you gentlemen are here on to discuss that uh, rent control was coming and eventually uh, was um, uh, adopted by, by Santa Ana, the first city in Orange County to adopt such a measure. As on my program, I've warned repeatedly about that it was coming, despite the fact of AB 1482 being a statewide blanket rent cap. But when people hear rent control, uh, I think that's the, uh, the lack of education for a lot of people is they don't understand that it's not just the rent cap. Uh, when you get rent control or a, or a stabilization ordinance, uh, a city like Santa Ana or Los Angeles, San Francisco, Berkeley, uh, and the like, we're talking about a new bureaucracy that's developed uh, with uh, sometimes uh, executing with extreme prejudice control over uh, property owners' properties. Uh, ultimately, the end game being to basically take away the property from, from property owners. Uh, I actually manage most of all of my property in, uh, in Los Angeles. So uh, just dealing with LA itself was something. So my father and I are investors. And when we had a chance to diversify, finally out of LA some years ago, I'm like, well, let's, let's look at some proper duplexes in, in, in Orange County. And we settled upon Santa Ana. Like, oh, great. I didn't know that would be the first domino to fall. Um, and like, well, just our luck. Uh, we could have picked a neighboring city and it wouldn't have been the first. 
because there were all these threats that uh, looks like Santa Ana was going to be uh, the strictest um, uh, RSO in in the state in the state. And that's saying something when I deal with Los Angeles. So when I, I, I educate people about rent control it, from tenants, property owners, investors, and the like, it's like, it's not, it's not just a rent cap. Uh, I was, it, I was talking with an investor this morning, uh, just about that. He was looking to buy a, a, a fourplex in uh, in Highland park. And so I have to look into the jurisdiction of LA city there, uh, because if it's not the city, it'll be the County um, because Highland park itself doesn't have rent control. But if LA has jurisdiction over it, then technically that means it would if they're incorporated into it. And if it's incorporated to LA, because like I never dealt with property that I'm buying where the rental rates were 50% below market rate. I'm like, yeah, that's by design. And if these tenants have been around for maybe a decade or two, they're going to feel they own the property. So they, they will have pushback. Uh, and not to mention the ever moving goalposts on the eviction moratorium. So if there's there's things that people do not understand. So that, as we hone into this, um, as I discovered your association, as I was investigating to see who is present on the ground doing something, and I saw that uh, your association was doing just that. CAA didn't respond to me, but uh, Chip, you did. So I appreciate that. Um, it. I, I know that we've been trying to schedule this uh, this conversation um, or this recording, but. And uh, you guys were really busy. Uh, I think you guys were trying to get a referendum to undo this RSO in Santa Ana, correct? Yeah. And uh, let me touch on that briefly. And, um, you know, the, the people over at CAA, they were part of our coalition, as were the realtors, as were mobile home park owners, as was the Orange County Taxpayers Association, as was the uh, Orange County Victims uh, Organization, uh, Crime Victims United. You know, there was a large coalition of people that got together on this and we were all working incredibly hard. And, you know, Andreas, you pointed out, you know, a lot of people don't think about the association as being something there for them. And realistically, this is what we do. I mean, you know, David's background in uh, community organizing and and working with uh, elected officials and governmental bodies goes back for decades. So does mine. We've had similar career paths. You mentioned Los Angeles. I had to deal with Los Angeles for a number of years because I used to run the Association of Realtors up that way. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you know, there these policies come up and they all come, I'll be honest with you, they all come from a good hearted place. Mm-hmm. The problem is when that thought process doesn't go from the good hearted place, trying to do a good thing for people in need and apply to, okay, what are the real world down cycle effects of this? You know, you mentioned these people you're dealing with up in Highland Park have been in that property for decades. Well, in those decades, have their economic conditions changed? Have they been in a place where maybe they could afford to move out and let somebody more needy of of a rent controlled unit move in? Uh, Well, when you look up to Berkeley, We've seen that a lot of the units up in Berkeley have been occupied by uh, professors since the 70s and before. So 50 years of being a professor, we've all seen how much tuition has gone up. It only stands to reason that professors pay has gone up as well. Mm -hmm. And how many students or adjunct professors or even just the janitors for the University of California, Berkeley, could have better served, uh, been better served by staying in those units rather than some professor who uses it as a weekday house while he goes back to Marin County. And there are countless uh, examples of that out there. You know, rent control is an attempt to help people that are struggling. We get that. We have programs we work with that. There are programs we endorse with that. We actually spend a lot of our time working with uh, housing providers to help them understand how a lot of these programs can be very beneficial to them as housing providers. So we completely understand and support that mission. What we don't support is a mission that doesn't solve the problem. Mm. And what we've found repeatedly with uh, rent control, just cause eviction, all of these ordinances is they're intended to help the person who's struggling, the person who's having difficulty, but they're gamed by the, in the system by people who know how to game the system. And in gaming the system, they make the community less safe, less affordable, and less welcoming to everybody, and not just the people that they were trying to help. You know, David, you had some great observations on some of the things you've seen happen in Santa Ana over the years, um, and, and how we've seen it change. And is this the Santa Ana you remember us having? 
Yeah, I mean, Santa Ana has changed a lot. And, and Andre, when you were talking about, you know, investing in Santa Ana and thinking this was a great, uh, you know, opportunity for, for you and your interests, um, you know, up until, you know, the last election, it probably was. Yeah. Um, and it really goes to show what the what one election can do to change mm. the, the trajectory that a city might be headed in. Uh, Santa Ana has a majority rental community. And up until that point, uh, the Apartment Association of Orange County was able to work well with city officials to address rental housing issues as they arose. Uh, we have a program that we helped design with the city going back you know, 20, 25 years um, for proactive rental inspections of units um, between, you know, that would allow quality housing to be insured and for the rental housing providers to be working with the city and maintaining uh, communication in a, you know, a beneficial way. With the change in the city council, city council composition last November, that is what allowed this rent control issue to even rise to the level that did and ultimately then, uh, you know, be passed by the city council this past October. Um, you have progressive thinking individuals now who are getting into these positions as policymakers and who oftentimes, if not, are sympathetic to the causes of tenant activist groups and, and, and renters, they're already in a position where they're looking to, you know, advance issues from a different perspective that work against solutions that bring both sides together. Um, and unfortunately, um, in this case, our industry, you know, was not even brought into the discussion uh, by city officials that rent control was even being considered. And I think that is, you know, for us, that is, a, a, you know, a hard thing to accept in, in so much as, you know, we have a, a, an entire industry here that provides affordable housing to a majority of rent or majority of residents within Santa Ana. Um, and yet now they're looking to pass a, an ordinance that will handicap our housing providers, will not result in a lowering of rents, but simply uh, impacting the amount that rent can be increased on an annual basis. Um, the unfortunate thing is these rent caps have now, have now been established in Santa Ana. Um, you know, they're not even allowing our housing providers to maintain rental levels or rent increases that keep up with inflation. Mm, and so yeah. now the, the, the problem is we're seeing a, an inability to keep up with inflation. The costs of doing business are going up as well, you know, and, and yet the return of an you know, an investment for our, our members and for rental housing providers in general is going to be you know handicapped uh, moving forward. And when you look at future investment in Santa Ana, um, you know there's a lot of speculation. Are people going to want to invest in the city, buying rental properties, rehabbing rental properties, putting money when they know they're not going to be able to recoup a lot of their investment? And I think it's it's highly inappropriate for a city to basically set an arbitrary, you know, percentage increase that they deem to be a reasonable rate of return. Um, it doesn't allow market forces to dictate um, how rents will, will move. And, uh, you know, that's very, it's troubling. Um, and unfortunately, I think Santa Ana is certainly the first, but I'm not sure it's going to be the last city in, in Orange County that is going to be looking at uh, these types of solutions uh, for their own uh, you know, challenges for the rental communities with that they represent. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, th I think I, I think you got a really good point there, David, and that is that you know these policies come in, and in the immediate, it doesn't seem like there's that much of an effect. I mean, so the rents aren't, aren't that far off. Well, I think we're going to see effects a lot sooner than otherwise we would have expected, because you're looking at a city that actually set their rent caps below the inflation rate intentionally below the inflation rate mm -hmm. in the same year that we have an inflation rate twice that of what we've had over the two previous years or any two previous years uh in in the last 10 so we're looking at a situation where the costs just to operate the property are going to go up really quickly and those landlords are going to have to make decisions of are we going to continue to provide services at the level we can and operate at a loss? Are we going to incur more debt so that we can try to weather this storm? Or are we going to have to cut some of the amenities we provide? And I think the really chicken thing about a lot of these uh, city councils that pass this is 
they're doing it knowing full well in six years from now, they'll be out of office. Eight years from now, they'll be out of office. It's someone else's problem at that point, which is just weak-willed policymaking and poorly thought out policy uh, advancement on the part of those tenants. Because who are they going to go back to? Those politicians are long gone, enjoying some other office that they've run for. So yeah. who's left with it? It's investors like you. It's it's organizations like ours. It's the tenants themselves trying to figure out how to unwind a mess that wasn't thought out in the first place. And you know the thing we, we with Santa Ana specifically, if the city had reached out to us before this ordinance was just introduced for council consideration going back to uh, late September, we could have talked about possible solutions to address the affordability issue that they were so concerned about. There are programs out there that could have been utilized. There are opportunities for us to create something new specifically within Santa Ana, but that was not something that the city council and staff ever reached out to us to even begin to discuss. They simply said, we want to do this rent control measure, this just cause eviction measure, and they made it so. And it's even questionable if they took these ordinance proposals and even did them uh, you know, correctly from the, the get-go. Um, is, this is something that the full city council probably should have discussed in an open meeting uh, before directing staff to come up with these ordinances. And that would have then allowed for more public input into the general issues that they were concerned about addressing rather than doing these uh, proposals behind closed doors and then dropping it on the council and saying, here you go, let's vote on it. And you know, unfortunately, we really felt like we were blindsided um, we view ourselves, the association, our members, the larger rental housing community as a partner with the cities and the communities that we own and operate our rentals in. And yet, in this case, we were never even you know, given a seat at the table when these you know, issues were first even you know, brought before city staff and, and council members to even look at. Um, you know, during the course of a couple of these council meetings, uh, you know, certain city council members made a point of saying, well, you know, we were looking at, you know, addressing housing issues in our city. You could have come to us with some ideas. But this is something that was generated by the city. If they had a proposal that they wanted to introduce, I think it's incumbent upon them to be reaching out to all the potential stakeholders that would be affected by these policies to weigh in. And, and yet that's not how they did it. It was completely backwards. And unfortunately, I think this is a reflection on how the new city. Uh, the Santa Ana City Council is going to be doing things moving forward when it comes to uh, establishing public policy moving forward. And that's very unfortunate. And I believe it's truly a disservice to the residents of Santa Ana and the businesses as well. People who have invested in the city and have you know, tried to make a commitment to being good partners with the, the local government. Absolutely. Because uh, I did tune in to the, the final um, city council meeting when they had to re-coordinate all this. I think it was late October. Uh, and I, I saw you know, the property owners that have been there for some time go up there and make their grievances. Uh, how come everything we said is still on the fears? You guys didn't consult with us. You guys are just literally ramming it through. And I, I, it, it almost seemed like the city council didn't care and like you said oh you guys uh should have come to with ideas uh there they were saying you guys didn't tell us about this so it's like uh how how do we know unless you're doing it behind the scenes and that was the whole intent and like as as chip you mentioned this the whole thing uh particularly because i'm most familiar with the lay born and raised there and um it dealt with rent control in my professional life as a contractor when dealing with the reos and then as a real estate, a real estate broker and property manager with my father so it rent control has been established in Los Angeles for decades. And the intent was to make housing affordable. The, the gotcha words, affordable housing, put a, a cap on, on rental rates and reduce homelessness. The opposite is true. The highest rents in the country, the uh, Los Angeles is the homelessness capital in the country uh, and San Francisco, not that far behind. Uh, so these policies have failed for decades. Like, dude, why are you even trying it again? The people voted rent control down with, um, when Proposition 10 reared its ugly head. And it, it, that thing shows up in so many different forms every single election cycle. But it was voted down by the majority. And I'm like, wow, there's a lot more rational people in California left. Thank God for that. But the legislator said that's not good enough. So a few months later, uh, in October 2019, that's when Governor Newsom um, signs AB 1482. Now, OK, stand my red cap. Uh, who didn't see that coming? Because uh, the tenant 
activists were mobilized just one month into the new year of that year to get this thing, uh, like at least on some way, somehow pushed through by the legislator in Sacramento. And then to see other uh, cities being emboldened to uh, go the rent control route. That's why I try to educate people. It's like that, uh, even though there's a blanket statewide rent cap, it's not rent control in the sense that people think of it to be. And that's one, I think, the, the bigger pushback from property owners that are well aware of this and organizations like yourself that educate and, uh, and advocate um, uh, to, to find the proper solutions because these things have failed every time they're tried, but the city just, uh, or uh, progressive ideals in dealing with property just default over to that and don't always see reasons. Yes, the intentions are good, but good intentions do pave the road, in this case, the economic hell, because uh, it hasn't worked out for LA or anywhere else that has, has implemented it. Um, and that's my fear for Santa Ana, that it will become a dilapidated uh, place. Uh, I'll, I'll be upfront with, with you guys that when we rented our first duplex in Santa Ana, uh, we had the highest uh, rental rates in the community. And uh, I had property owners calling me. He's like, are you, gonna, are, are you even getting people interested in being able to pay that? Will they be able to afford it? Uh, and when the, the tenants came over to check our, our units, like, you have luxury apartments here. It's like, well, we want a, a good commodity and what we're offering to the people. And then they outbidded themselves to that. We'll pay you more rent for this unit. Right. And we have very little turnover. We, uh, I always tell property owners, this is a business. Look at it that way, where you got to do the 80-20 rule. 80% of your business comes from 20% of your clients. Good tenants will take care of your property. You will have less issues with your um, homeowner's insurance and things like that. Uh, and uh, we want uh, uh, to sustain these relationships. That's why we have long-term tenancies, 15 years, 20 years. And they, they also understand this is not their property, uh, but they uh, take care of it as if it was their own home. And every opportunity we get when some people come up and tell us that we want to be homeowners ourselves. Excellent. We, we try to see how we can help them in certain ways to be able to like, Hey, look, if you're moving in, in certain, uh, if it's confirmed, you're an escrow, uh, we'll maybe forgive that one month uh, worth of, of rent. So you can use it towards your deposit or whatever. No, it's, it's, it's a relationship. And I think that's where the communication has failed. But uh, that's my concern uh, with the, uh, with rent control, not being there that i um, I don't know, at least for myself, I'm not interested in getting more properties in Santa Ana when I will have to deal with this because uh, um, there's there was a scare in the letter that was being sent around. That I got pushed back from, from, some, um, from some commenters and antenna activists that are telling me that the letter was incorrect. There is nothing uh, spelled out in the eviction ordinance, uh, the updated eviction ordinance that says that uh, um, a criminal tenants have to be prosecuted by a DA. Uh, I'm sure that was brought up in some way. So I'm like, I did hear the conversations, but I didn't see it explicitly and it's not spelled out in the ordinance but uh what are the rumblings that i'm gonna toss this to you guys um it it's even if it's not spelled out i know they can bring it on later but is that a, a concern for property owners that if they have a troublesome tenant uh just getting them off the property by police is not enough they have to be prosecuted by the da uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, and I'm going to have Dave talk a little bit about this as well, um, because I know he and I have gone back and forth about, you know, what is happening here? You know, in general, with a just cause eviction situation, you have to have an eyewitness and a conviction mm. in order to get the person off. Well, who's the eyewitness? The tenant that has to live next to the person uh, who's potentially being evicted? who's potentially a criminal and be willing to be the person stepping out and saying, Hey, I saw this guy do it. Is it going to be the landlord who's there trying to work with the different tenants to provide housing opportunities and try to make sure that the community works well together? Is it the maintenance worker who has to see that person each and every day? Who wants to be the witness? Who can be the witness? Who reasonably should be the witness? Or, and this is the more scary part, if you ask me, is it the other tenant in the unit? Because one of the things that the tenants activist group pointed out, which we think is a, a nice attempt, is you know, somebody who's a victim of domestic abuse. How do we protect them? That's a great question. You know how you can't protect them? By forcing them to be the witness against the person who just abused them. And if you get them out and you set it up so that uh, the tenants can sign new people into the leases, 
and they could just be forced to sign the person who abused them right back onto the lease. Hmm. I mean, come on, that's, it's, it's just a not thought out process. And that, and I think, you know, you, you nailed it. How do you provide a, you went through exactly what the reality of landlords is. And that is they have a house that they provide. They bring someone in, they help them through the process. It's a relationship. The tenants activist group came out saying that they didn't want to be seen as a business. Okay, fine. You want to see us as evil landlords, but you don't want to be seen as part of a business. That's fine. But the reality is it costs a a landlord tons of money to evict someone. They have no interest in evicting someone. They want long-term tenants. They want a long-term relationship. They don't want to have situations where there's any sort of disharmony in their community and forcing there to be eyewitnesses going out and, and, and being willing to testify against their neighbor. That's not harmony in a, in a unit. And David, you, you had some good thoughts. Yeah, well, I, I think even you know, looking beyond just the, the, the person who's been accused of committing a crime, you have potentially other people in that unit that perhaps are willing accomplices mm. and have, you know, maybe not been the ones directly involved in creating a, a, a disruption or, you know, illegal activity at a rental community, but they've allowed it to go on and they're not addressing it within their family or within those who are residing within that unit. Um, there's some culpability there as well. And for a, a rental housing provider who recognizes that, yeah, you maybe have the one bad actor who's been, arrested or been accused of something or has been observed doing something, but there's not accountability for those who are also in the unit, well, then you can't get rid of any of them. And they're all ultimately contributing to some sort of illegal activity or disruption uh, within the community that ultimately they should be able to then be evicted for. Um, now, again, it just it puts it on one person. There has to be a conviction. Yes, there also has to be now someone willing to testify against that person. Um, bottom line, the, the just cause eviction law makes it more difficult for a landlord to you know, responsibly manage and operate their property and maintain a, you know, a safe and habitable and quality of, of life environment for all the other residents in that community. Um, yeah. And I think that's the unfortunate thing is it's focusing on one instance, but yet, you know, there are more people than just that one unit that are involved. Um, so whether or not you're, you know, the, the tenant activists are saying that this, this is necessary because landlords are just going to evict people who are, you know, struggling and, you know, are, are fighting back against rent increases or, you know, whatever the rationale is. Here's the thing. Quality of life is going to be impacted, not only even in, within the rental community, but the neighborhood where it's located. And that has then a snowball effect. It goes out into the, the greater Santa Ana community when you have multiple locations that are struggling with these types of issues. Um, and so that's, you know, the protections that are already in place should be sufficient when it comes to the handling of evictions. We have state laws already dealing with this. Um, there's not a need to make evictions more difficult in Santa Ana. And ultimately, that's what this is going to do. It's going to make it more difficult, and it will have an impact on you know, how our members and how rental housing providers in general will be able to operate their properties from this point forward. And it's not a, it's not a positive direction, unfortunately. Yeah, and, and there's let's, a... Let's be clear about something. Right. You know, evictions are not an attempt to get more money from another person who's willing to pay more. That is not the purpose of an eviction. It never has been as far as I've ever been involved with the industry. And maybe in The Godfather, that was a way to make it work. And Godfather 2, the old uh, Don Giuseppe kicking out the poor old lady and her son with their puppy. That isn't reality. That's not why somebody does this. Evictions happen because there's a problem with the tenant. They're not paying their uh, rent. They are causing disruptions for the neighbors. They are making it a bad place. That is where eviction is. Nobody wants to go through this. I mean, it's twenty, thirty thousand dollars when you go through all the court fees up in Los Angeles to get someone out. That's a high expense. You then have to turn over the property. That's going to be another, another several thousand dollars. So to the the housing provider, it is immensely more expensive to evict somebody. They don't want to go down that route. 
Everyone's afraid of eviction because of what it could mean for them. But you have to understand that's not the intent of the landlord. The purpose of eviction is to get rid of a bad actor. It's not to get more money out of the next tenant because it's going to be a lot more expensive for you to even recoup the cost just to get rid of the first tenant. So stop thinking about it in that perspective. Yeah. Instead, look at it as how are you able to better provide quality housing for everybody in the community and not just the one person who's being impacted by their decisions? Yeah, and I'll say one thing, you know, we, we, you know, we, there are always going to be isolated incidents where you do have, you know, a landlord who, you know, isn't, isn't in alignment with what our industry standards and practices are and should be. There are going to be bad actors, but mm-hmm. those are isolated cases. And unfortunately, and we see this at all levels of government, government is looking for, you know, solutions to problems that don't exist in the way that they're being characterized. And unfortunately, in a case, you know, in Santa Ana, if there is a situation where you do have a landlord who's being a bad actor, there are remedies that can be used to address that on a case by case basis. Instead, this has become now a a blanket solution for all rental housing providers. And it's unfairly, you know, impacting, I would say, 90, 99% of our members and, and, and housing providers in the city who are doing things the right way, who are trying to be fair, who, you know, again, like Chip was saying, aren't looking to have to go through an extensive eviction process that ends up costing them thousands upon thousands of dollars. That's the reality. And so it doesn't, it's not in their interest to be arbitrarily evicting people. Um, You know, they want to keep these units filled. And and Chip was mentioning a little while ago about, you know, so many of our our members and, and others who have worked with uh, with their renters over the years. And, and I think, Andres, you were saying, you know, something about, you know, keeping keeping rents low. You know, we've had people who have been doing this. They've been working with their renters to make sure that their units can remain affordable. And they've perhaps been making a decision to keep their units under current market levels in order to be fair and to, you know, maintain a long-term residency. Um, now with the, the uh, rent control ordinance having been passed, now, you know, you know, take an effect. Um, if you have an under market unit that you've been doing out of goodwill and, yeah, so and well. the desire to keep keep affordable housing available for your renters, well, now you're stuck with a you know a under market unit that you're not now going to ever be able to bring up to current market you know levels um, with the current three uh, percent cap that's been imposed. Yeah, absolutely. And all this is not what about ism. Some people will hear these stories and wow. we didn't just come up with this out of the blue. Uh, so I was I was interviewed by um, by a, a property management firm out in um, Massachusetts and we were discussing um, rent control because at, just at the time when California did their statewide rent cap. So they brought me on and I was trying to give a cautionary tale to uh, for New Yorkers because uh, they, well, they, they were, they were uh, trying to figure that out too and they ended up um, it's passing state rent control anyway. So there's a particular story I was saving for, for this conversation because everything you just mentioned, this is happening right now. And this is in Los Angeles in the incorporated city of LA. So there's a multi-unit property that I, that I manage with my father and uh, the tenants are long-term tenants, but recent tenants, one of them is a section eight tenant. It's supposed to be just her. Uh, her son, um, apparently, well, I don't, I don't know if it was institutionalized or just out of prison. Point is, uh, he showed up too, and that's not part of the agreement, uh, especially with Section Eight. It's supposed to be an individual, uh, but uh, this individual um, ended up uh, threatening our tenants, uh, violently attacked some of them, and was very was being very lewd to some of the kids that were there. And we had panic, frantic calls uh, from ten a.m. I'm telling you, to ten p.m. middle of the night uh, to two a.m., three a.m. calls. Say he's here. He's doing it, and. Uh, us being located in Orange County, um, it's like, well, it's not much that we can do per se, even though uh, it's my father's property. He, he just got up in the middle of the night and went over there to see what he can do. And like, well, there's not much you can do as a property owner, but they they said, well, this is your property. You can deal with it, but not with LA. We're shackled. So nothing much we can do there. In this case, the, the tenants have to be the ones to report to the police where they have been defunded and they have guests gone being the DA. This guy, the police show up, oh, we know who he is. Like, well, get him out of here. Well, has he, has, has he, uh, wh- where's the proof that he actually hit some of you guys? Um, we, we can't just remove him for trespassing and things like that. It's not worth our while. 
And uh, the, the last call, I think it was the third call that the police uh, showed up. Um, they just had to see him off the property and then they went their own merry way. They they need to wait until he's a bigger fish to fry in order to be able to convict him because like, well, nothing we could do. We, uh, we can book him and then release him. Nothing changes. So it's not worth their time. Like our tenants are scared half to death about this. Yeah. And th- this not what about us. It happens. So just the, the, the fact that even if Santa Ana would be on par with that, and as I responded to, uh, to those that gave me some pushback, like, oh, the CAA is lying about all that or exaggerating. I'm like, even if it's not spelled out in the eviction, that doesn't mean it won't be that way. Because anybody that's mm-hmm. rent control knows, like, well, that's just the base and they just keep piling on it. And a- any other council uh, member or uh, another legislation can come along and just keep adding to this. And since we're running up on time, that, that, that leads me to what, um, what can property owners possibly see as being, uh, besides education about this whole thing, but is there a chance to, um, to, to, ha- to be able to put this on a referendum of sorts? What can be done about this? Well, uh, and we talked earlier about the effort that was undertaken once the ordinances took effect or uh, were passed. You know, we did have a 30-day window to try to qualify a referendum, uh, the goal being to allow the voters of Santa Ana to decide whether or not they believe rent control and just cause eviction are policies that they want to be applied citywide. Um, unfortunately, we, we came up short in that 30-day window, uh, collecting the necessary number of valid signatures um, but that's not to say that this issue is done. Uh, we are certainly, you know, as a, a coalition of, of, you know, housing associations and, and business groups and, and others that are concerned about these, uh, these policy issues in Santa Ana, we're looking at other approaches we can take to address it moving forward. Uh, whether that's, you know, you know, looking at, you know, changing the composition of the city council, we have elections that are coming up um, in 2022. Uh, that is always a, an option to really put efforts into identifying uh, candidates who might be better representatives of the entire city and understand and appreciate these particular issues as being important to revisit and perhaps uh, change these laws that have recently taken effect. Um, there's a possibility that maybe we come back and try to qualify uh, an ordinance to overturn uh, these measures um, mm-hmm. On the ballot in 2022, that's another possibility where we would have more time to go out and uh, gather the necessary number of signatures to qualify that for the the ballot. Um, and then there, are, you know, other things we're looking at. I mean, it's this is not an issue that is you know done forever. We we feel there are certainly uh, concerns that remain, and I think as more people do become educated about the threats and uh, the the slippery slope that this type of of legislation represents. Uh, they can recognize that, yeah, what, what starts representing or only affecting, uh, you know, rental units uh, could be expanded. And it could go to affect single family residencies that are being used as rentals or individual bedrooms in a home that are being rented out. Um, you know, you start down with you know, one group being affected. But, you know, over time, uh, the city council, I think, has that potential to uh, make it even uh, a more expansive policy that will take into, uh, you know, take into effect more more people in the city uh, who own homes and are looking to maybe rent out units or have accessory dwelling units or anything like that. Um, it's this is a problem. And uh, you know we will continue to you know find ways to address it. And uh, if we can overturn it uh, through you know the vote of the people, that would be great. I also think it's really important for us to start telling the truth of what housing provider uh, and the apartment industry and, and the rental housing industry, what they truly do. You know, Andreas, you went through what is exactly the relationship between the housing provider and their tenants should be, what you guys are doing in Santa Ana, helping them along the way, understanding their needs, providing for them quality housing so they feel like they're living in a place that they can want to take care of while they set themselves up to the point where they want to move in and buy a house and a program that you set up where you help them make that down payment and work with them and give them those opportunities to create the institutional wealth that they're seeking in this industry and seeking for their families and seeking for their community. We need to start telling that story a little more. So Andreas, I want to hear your story a lot more. I want anybody else out there that has similar stories. And I know that there are millions of them because in all the time I've spent working with uh, housing providers, I've met some who I thought to myself, I don't want to work with that person. Mm. 
and I've met a whole lot more that make me think, wow, that is exactly what makes communities thrive is the relationship that person has with their tenants and with their neighborhoods and with their cities. Because the truth of the matter is, the only way we get people to understand that we're not kicking out the lady from the 1920s in New York in a story that was fictionalized intentionally to make someone look bad is by telling them what the reality truly is. You know, we fix these problems by talking to one another. We're starting to change our messaging here at the Apartment Association. We're sharing some of these stories, some of these realities. Um, one of the things we're going to be posting today is a comparison of inflation rates. Hmm. You know, since 2010, inflation has been 27% over that entire time. The, in, the cost of housing, however, has gone up 89%. The cost of rents has gone up 31%. Now, yes, that is above what the overall inflation rate was, but marginally. You know, we take a look at what the cost of a flight was in 2010 mm. versus today, and it's wildly different. Yeah. We take a look at the, the bumps up that are there. And yes, rents have gone up, but they haven't gone up commensurate with what their costs have been. And we need to show people that the reality is we need to see the truth of the matter, not the fictionalized story, not the made up organized group that shows up telling a story that is completely illegal and everybody on the face of the earth knows is illegal as did tenants United through this entire program saying that there were people being evicted and their rents were going up $500 a month, each month uh, consistently. It's just not even, non it's not even sensible that that could happen, let alone at a time when there is both a rent freeze and an eviction moratorium. So the truth needs to get out there and we need to have people like you telling your story. We need some of your listeners to give us a call. Let us know. We need people watching this to say, hey, I see what the Apartment Association is doing. I saw their Instagram feed. I want to share it out with my people. Let's get that truth out there. Let's have that conversation so that people truly know what this industry is about and stop making legislation based off of stories that are completely unsubstantiated. Absolutely. That's actually a really good point to end on. Uh, so I really appreciate um, that, uh, that that closer there, Chip. Um, and before before we close out, uh, where can people learn more about AAOC? Well, uh, the easiest way is to visit our website. It's uh, www.aaoc.com. Uh, for those of you who are listening and viewing, uh, who are on social media, uh, our social media handle is at we are AAOC. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and uh, Twitter. And, uh, you know, those are always the, the easiest ways to reach us. You can also give us a call, uh, 714-245-9500. Or you can just shoot us an, uh, an email and you just send it to info at aaoc.com. And a member of our team will uh, get back to you and provide you whatever information you're looking for. Uh, you know, we hold uh, membership meetings um, throughout the year for our members. And, it, you know, we provide a lot of information on uh, issues that are affecting them, uh, whether it's dealing specifically on the rent control issue and just cause evictions in Santa Ana or other uh, topics that are helping our members, uh, you know, do their jobs to the best of their abilities. Uh, these are held on a monthly basis, and uh, they can always, uh, as a member, attend these meetings for free. And um, we have also, you know, educational programs that we offer throughout the year, again, aimed at helping our members do the jobs to the best of their ability and making sure that, uh, you know, through the education, they are making sure that their operations are, in fact, compliant with uh, local and state regulations um, and that they're aware of what the emerging threats are and uh, that they're prepared and can address them um, in a way that will not, um, you know, hurt them and their business operations. Yeah. And for the, the listener and the viewer, everything that um, David just spelled out will be available at the show notes of companies episode at www.newsgova.com. Um, all links to their website will also be there as well. Now, gentlemen, we're going to wrap it up here um, for, for the listeners, but please, please do not hang up because uh, I want to talk to you guys off camera just a bit because as someone has a platform, I would love uh, to also uh, be a way to uh, help signal boost a lot of, of what's coming up, especially as we take the fight um, to the city council and we continue to, to fight for property rights, uh, for affordable housing, and 
well, just to educate people ultimately, um, in the, particularly in this case, the city of Santa Ana. So thank, thank you, you so much for listening David to this episode of the Andres Agobre Show. Remember to like, share, show. subscribe, stay in the know. If you, you want a question featured on the program or you never know, it could be an episode all its own, you can message me at any of the social media links available, really the social media links available at my website, www.theandresagobre.com. Also available there are all the directories where you can find my show. Remember to also follow me on YouTube and Instagram where other exclusive content resides. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the program. I'll see you on the next one.